Okay, so this paper is with uh, Andrew Plantinga and Aurélie Rangeval de Luz, for both uh, from the University of California, Santa Barbara, and the University of Reims. So it's uh, about the, the main determinants of um, land prices and prices of, uh, of grapes in the Champagne region in France. So we analyze here vineyard, sa vineyard sales and grape prices in the Champagne region and we try to determine whether this uh, so-called Echelle des Crus rating system is still an anchor in the land market and the market for grapes. The EDC, we will call it the EDC here, is a set of numerical uh, quality scores for all the villages in the region used as part of a price setting system for wine grapes. And the region, as you can see here, is located here in the north, in northern France. And we have four main regions, uh, producing regions called Montagne de Reims, Vallée de la Marne, around, around Reims, the, the largest city in the region. And the year you have uh, Epernay, around Vallée de la Marne, and also here, Côte des Blancs is the third uh, region known for the, the for their Chardonnay. And Côte des Bar, further south, is uh, a region around this city called Troyes. So here, uh, the, to, to give you an idea about the, the system, it began in 1919 and persisted until 1990, but when it was abandoned in favor, in favor of a free market system for establishing grape prices. And nowadays, the EDC no longer plays a role uh, in determining uh, grape prices and therefore should have n absolutely no influence on any prices in in the market for champagne, for grape prices, for land prices. But however, however given it's important throughout the 20th century, it's possible, it's possible that this system, the EDC, is an anchor for participants in the land market or and the market for grapes. So. To give you an idea about the size of this market, the market for grapes um, was a, an estimated 241,000 tons of grapes traded in 1990. And this figure is pretty stable over time, I think, because the uh, Palatian area is, is, uh, didn't increase uh, since uh, 1990. And two thirds of all champagne are produced by negociants like uh, Moite Chandon, located in Epernay, or Moom, that are pretty famous brands. And basically, negociants purchase grapes from growers in the surrounding area uh, within the Appalachian area. It's forbidden to buy grapes uh, outside of the Appalachian area. Um, so we had several editions of the EDC. We started with only um, 145 villages with a mean rating of 65, that was in 1911. The minimum rating was 46% uh, in, that, in that year. 100% was the maximum rating. And you see here uh, that the last edition of the EDC was with more villages, 352, with a minimum of 80% and 100%. All the, these percentages were used before 1992 to set the price paid for a kilogram of grapes in each village, like you, they were the 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 the, the CVC were used to set a, a price, the regulated price, and you multiply the price by the EDC times divided by 100, and you get the price that you were uh, forced to pay to buy grapes in the region. So, for example, in this um, in this village called menil sur the, the which is um, which which enjoys an EDC rating of 100%. And in 1990, the price, the official price, was 4.39 euros for a kilogram of grapes, and the price received by the growers was exactly this price. And in a, in a different in a different village called Mongueux in Aube, for instance, just an example, many villages have a rating of 80%. So you multiply 80% by 4.39 and you get the price received by the grower uh, for a kilogram of grapes. 
So that's rude. It's really bad when you're located in a village uh, like Mongeux. And is it fair? I don't really think so, because in these two places, I took these examples because these are good regions, good, good villages for Chardonnay grapes. In Mongeux, you have pretty famous producers like Jacques Lassaigne, and in many sur, uh, sur Roger, this is ov obviously a very good place for Chardonnay grapes as well. This is where Krog has his own Clos du Menil, and if you, if you take a look here, the only uh, difference I think, except that the soil is different, but th these are two good places for Chardonnay grapes, is the distance to the largest city uh, in the region called Reims. So, here you see that champagnes produced out of these grapes coming from Mongeux with, with a very low rating, so you cannot expect to make good wine out of these grapes. That the scores that uh, La Seine gets from, from expert, uh, wine expert is pretty high compared to Claude du Minel, and these prices you pay much, much more for a bottle of Claude du Minel than for a bottle of La Seine. So is uh, the EDC use is still used to set to determine these um, uh, appellations Grand Cru and Premier Cru. Uh, Grand Cru uh, Champagne is made of grapes coming from villages ranked 100% in the EDC. Premier Cru, uh, the appellation is used is uh, comes from wines is. Uh, stands for wines made with grapes from villages ranked uh, from 90 to 99, and Autre Cru is the other uh, champagnes. Okay, so I'm gonna maybe skip this. Um, no, no, I'm gonna, I shouldn't skip this because Steve, you're, uh, you're on this slide, so I will not skip this slide. So we found uh, a long time ago, and Steve more recently with David Menival, that there's uh, a higher prices were paid for these champagnes coming from, uh, made of grapes coming from fancy regions uh, in, uh, as recognized by the EDC. So, is this system a smart system or a naive rating system? So, if you take the example of this village uh, called Verzi, uh, we had the uh, tour in 2009 in this village, and uh, you see that all one village corresponds to one rating, but two different altitudes. One village, one rating, but very different slopes and land attributes. One village, one rating, but very different exposures. And so you don't really want, uh, I, I mean, I don't really trust a rating system based on, you know, it's just a rating for a village with such, hetero uh, such an heterogeneity within the village. So if we take another example, this is good producer, Boulard, and uh, Boulard actually uses for uh, this uh, this champagne the grapes coming from the Vallée de la Marne, and the, the EDC, the average EDC in this region is 84 percent, and you see the scores here, which are pretty high. And if we take another uh, another champagne from this producer, based on very different grapes from coming from uh, this area around Reims, and the EDC is at around 86 percent. These ratings are pretty high as well. So in the, the last, uh, last champagne I would like to show you is the champagne coming from this village, Mailly Champagne, uh, which Mailly is based in Vallée de la Marne. And the EDC there is 100%, but you see there's no much difference in terms of quality between all of these champagnes. So to me, uh, that my, I expect not so much different coming from in terms of quality from this, uh, this uh, rating system. So the main, job, the main objectives of this paper is to check whether the EDC is still used as seen as an anchor by champagne producers and we based our estimations on vineyard prices and grape prices. So the model that we are going to estimate is a model, uh, a price model as a function of land characteristics, weather uh, characteristics, and the EDC. And the EDC, of course, is endogenous in this uh, setup and depends 
on on other on some of the things on land characteristics and weather conditions. So we have to use an instrument to get rid of the uh, uh, the bias coming from this endogeneity issue. So we the the the, the, the instrument that we used is the distance to the larger city rims. Why distance the why distance to rims should be a good instrument a good instrument. So we claim in the paper that this instrument is exogenous. The decision actually of this champagne house is to locate in this city in the 18th century is not really based on the quality of the um, of the of the vineyards located around around the city. So this has nothing to do with the quality of the vineyards around. So actually, the the reason why they located in the, in Rims all of these champagne houses, it, not all of them, but actually the, most of it, some of these are located in Epernay, but. Around the planet, this the, the quality of the vineyards is much higher, so that the argument doesn't hold. Here in Rims, besides being the major center for commerce in the region, Rims offered another advantage to these champagne houses. If you remember, if you were in Reims in 2009, we had to visit at Tetanger, and Tetanger uh, is uh, beneath. Beneath the city, there, were, there is a large network, network of caves, caves dating back to the Gallo-Roman period. They used to, to, uh, they, to this is a remnant uh, of limestone quarries used to build the city that could be easily converted to cellars for storing champagne. So actually, this has nothing to do with any, uh, any champagne production, which they all came after. So we claim also in the paper that this is relevant. The largest, latest versions of the EDC still depend to a certain extent on the distance factor. So if you see here, this is a regression, a basic regression of the EDC against the distance to rims. So we calculated the distance to rims for each village in the EDC. And you see here that we get large, uh, large uh, significant coefficient, which is at around 0.05, and it is we get uh, R square of 32 percent, which means that without anything else, we explain one third of the variance in the EDC just because of the distance. Does that make sense nowadays? We don't really think so. And if we had some other characteristics, land, land characteristics, and also some weather variables, this is just a stepwise step regression of the EDC against a series of uh, uh, controls. And we get that, say, here it decreases, of course, the coefficient of the EDC. We get 3.03 for a kilometer uh, if you're further. Uh, out of rims, then it means that if you're at 100 located at 100 kilometers of the of rims, then you will be rated three less points. All of the things equal. And if you have more shark uh, limestone, then ten, just 10 percent more limestone means six points more uh, more points, 6.6 .6 points and so on and so forth. So model number two explains 66% of the EDC. The rest is probably some political variables around that. Uh, uh, you know, some influ maybe some politicians were more influential in some regions, and then we don't have the information, sadly, about the committees behind, uh, the, behind the EDC. So I should be extremely careful about uh, the schedule. Okay. Okay, so the cost of transporting grapes nowadays is, oh, I shouldn't, I'm done, no, I have no idea, so I forgot. So could you tell me if I have to finish the presentation soon? And the cost of transporting grapes to Rims was an important uh, consideration when the EDC was started, they, when they started in 1911, but no longer as an appreciable re effect on returns uh, to grape production. So if you, if you take a look here, the, the ratio between the transportation cost to the total value of a load of grapes from these three regions in uh, two rims is less than 0.5% of the value of the load. So it says now it's it's cheap to to uh, ship the grapes to the to this uh, to the negociant. 
Okay, so uh, again, so some information about the uh, theory that there is behind what we're testing. So sources of information, we have uh, uh, soil, soil vineyard transactions, around 12,000 observations, and uh, grape prices, we have around 10,000 grape prices over a long period of time, 1991 to 2012. Uh, oh, sorry. So this is the evolution of grape prices over a sample period. Uh, uh, vineyard prices tripled over the sample period. Uh, two, three minutes. Thank you, Jean-Marie. That's great. Uh, um, so we estimated vi uh, this uh, these models for vineyard prices, we didn't have the possibility to include at the same time the EDC in the model, plus these dummy variables for standing for Grand Cru and Premier Cru, of course, because Premier Cru is, is defined, is based on the, on the values of the EDC. So this is why we split actually the data set in two parts, Premier Cru vineyards and Autre Cru vineyards to get some heterogeneity in the EDC to capture the effect of the EDC. So we use our instrument, uh, instrumental viable approach and get the following IV results. So for Autre Cru, Autre Cru a one unit increase in the EDC increases the price of vineyards by 7%. So for Premier Cru it's even more, a one unit increase in, this, in the EDC increases the price of vineyards by 9.4%. And um, prices are increasing in the size of the parcel, and there is a, we also found a strong upward trend in the nominal price of vineyards. And I'm going to skip this. Year by year, we interacted the EDC with uh, all year dummies, and we see clearly that there's an increasing effect, more or less, an incre there's a clear increasing effect. Uh, over time of the EDC for Premier Cru, uh, Premier Cru vineyards. And not, not true, doesn't hold for Autre Cru, which the effect is, is growing, that it's less clear that the effect of the EDC is growing. Uh, we did the same uh, type of regressions for grape prices and same model, but we included here contemporaneous uh, weather variable instead of uh, annual uh, weather variables. And uh, the, the result that we get, of course, are, are, are a bit lower. A one unit increase in DDC increases the price of grape by 2% for, for Premier Cru grapes. Uh, that's uh, a bit lower. And the effect is smaller for the vineyard prices. Of course, this is, of course, this is capitalized by of the stream of profits over time. So the EDC was officially abandoned in the recent past, but despite this, the EDC still had uh, still has an had an increasing impact on PC, on Premier Cru grape prices, and a significant but decreasing impact on the AC grape prices. Conclusion. One minute? Okay. So, overall, we find strong evidence for anchoring. So, the EDC still has a very uh, still have a, a significant influence on prices in the, mar in, in the market for champagne. In all of the IV specifications we used, the EDC is found to have a positive and significant effect on grape and vineyard prices. The effects of anchoring are large in magnitude. And the role of the EDC should in determining prices for grapes officially ended in 1990. That Yet, all results indicate that it continues to have a strong influence on great and vineyard prices. So the main reasons that we have in mind for this is probably an increased uncertainty uh, due to first climate change, but also there's nowadays an upcoming extension of the Appalachian area that would actually increase the number that would increase by one third the entire Appalachian area, but with villages which are, as you can see here, this is in grey, the uh, current Appalachian area, and you see all of this village that will be, that should be included in the Appalachian area, maybe in 2020, so all of these villages will be ranked l at, uh, with a rate 
uh, lower than uh, ninety percent. This will not be this will not be villages uh, premier cru villages. So maybe the reason why do you see an increasing effect of the EDC is that nowadays. Uh, uh, participants in the market want to buy these uh, fancy lands which are used to, which generate a premium, a price premium. It's, uh, it, you sell your champagne at a higher price and then now buy these lands and it makes sense to buy these lands, these good lands, supposedly good lands, uh, now and they will cost maybe, uh, they will cost more in the future. And that, that's it for uh, the presentation.